Welcome to the Cardiovascular Pulse, where we dive into medical breakthroughs, leading technology, and healthy lifestyles. Join us as we empower you on your journey to a healthier and stronger you. Our guest today is Dr. Craig Walker, founder, president, and medical director at Cardiovascular Institute of the South. We're here today at the CIS Ambulatory Surgery Center, a state-of-the-art center offering outpatient procedures and a comprehensive vein center as well. Welcome, Dr. Walker, to the show. Thank you. Tell me a bit about when someone should see a cardiologist if they suspect they suffer from these diseases. Sure. The board specialty that we take is called cardiovascular diseases. And so it's very important, and certainly we cannot disassociate the peripheral vascular system from the heart. To start with, it may be the only clue that one has heart disease. Finding peripheral vascular disease is important. Secondly, in evaluating the heart, we can't do it if there's tremendous peripheral arterial disease. An angiogram may be difficult because we may have problems getting to the heart to do the angiogram. Or even a treadmill may be difficult because if a patient cannot walk and raise the level of their heart rate, the treadmill may be useless. So it is very important as we're treating patients who have heart disease, often we have to give what we call hemodynamic support. Machines that help to hold the blood pressure up while we're working on the heart and causing cessation of blood flow. Well, these devices go through the peripheral arteries and the peripheral veins. And if they're obstructed, we may not be able to use them. So this is all one basic spectrum of disease. And certainly we know that certain people are more likely to have uh, these disorders. We know that on the arterial side, you're more likely to have arterial disease as you get older. Just being above age 70 is a risk. In fact, there was a trial done called the Pardners trial, looking to see how many people had peripheral arterial disease. And they simply measured pressure in the legs and pressure in the arms and compared it. Those two should be the same. If the pressure in the legs was substantially lower than the pressure in the arms, that meant peripheral arterial disease. It is a very specific finding. And what they found was in people over the age of 70, 29% had evidence of a diminished ankle brachial index or had evidence of peripheral arterial disease. And in patients above the age of 50, if they had smoked or had diabetes mellitus, 29% of those had peripheral arterial disease. So more than one in four, in fact, closer to one in three of those patients had peripheral arterial disease. So those are simply high risk patients. But what should a patient look for if they're thinking they might have peripheral arterial disease? Well, to start with, they may feel leg cramping when they walk or leg pain. They may Notice that they're having to slow their stride down because uh, their legs just don't keep up. They feel tired or heavy. And then, of course, if they see loss of hair, or if they see that they're developing ulcers or certainly gangrenous changes of the toes, then those are absolutely uh, 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 representative of, of severe pathology at that point. But what about venous disease? Venous disease presents predominantly with leg swelling. Why is that? Well, unlike arteries, which have a lot of pressure in them, the heart is squeezing and under high pressure, blood is driven to all parts of our body. Blood has to return from our feet against gravity with no major pump to push it. So there are a series of valves that help to keep the blood going only in that one direction, but very few things help to get the blood back to the heart when we're upright. As we take in a deep breath, or as our heart relaxes, there's a bit of a negative pressure in the chest, helping to bring the blood back. Secondly, there's a bit of pressure left when blood goes from the arteries through the capillaries where it gives off the oxygen and the nutrients and is picked up by the veins on the other side. There's a little bit of pressure left to help drive blood up. That is called vis atergo, meaning push from behind. But predominantly, what pushes this blood forward is as our calf muscles contract, Blood is squeezed up bit by bit by bit until it can keep circulating. Now, as you might imagine, uh, that's a very complex system. And if it doesn't work well, and if you don't return this blood, the legs start to swell. I tell people, it's as if you had a garden with no drains. If you keep applying water, 
but there's no drainage, then the water builds up. Well, in venous disease, the blood builds up and it causes swelling. It makes the leg discolored. And over time, uh, one may develop things like varicose veins. And we know certain people are more likely to develop these. People who have occupations where they're upright because they're fighting gravity all day long. Uh, so certainly barbers, hairdressers, teachers, people like that have a very high incidence of venous disease. We know that some people are more likely to clot. Classically, we all know about birth control pills and smoking. That makes one much more likely to clot. But there are many other things that can make us clot. Uh, in the 1850s, a very famous pathologist, Virchow, came up with what was called Virchow's triad. And what he said was, there are three things that make you more likely to clot. One, if you are hypercoagulable. So if your blood is going to clot more than another person's anyway, and there are many things that can do that. Just like there are free bleeders on one side where you bleed more likely, there are genetic problems that can make you clot more likely than other people. And there are environmental things that can do that. As I've mentioned before, birth control pills and smoking being a very, very common uh, one of those environmental issues but there are many others. Certain infections can predispose you to clotting. Other things can do this. So that is hypercoagulability. That's one point of this triangle called Ver Verkau's triad. The other part is injury. And we know that people who've broken their hip are much more likely to have clots. People who have hip surgery or knee surgery are much more likely to develop clots during those surgeries. Why? Because of injury. And then the third part is stasis, the blood not moving. Now, what, what causes us to have that problem is immobility. If we're laying in a bed for a long time, not moving, we're not causing the calf, pus, uh, the calf muscle to pump the blood, and therefore, blood just sits there. And when blood just sits there, it clots. So stasis, where we're not making the blood move, injury, where we've actually injured the vein, or hypercoagulability. Those people are much more likely to develop clots. And that is the most serious manifestation of vein disease because that results in the potential of having clots break off and go to the lungs, stopping us from getting oxygen to the rest of our body. But another huge problem that many don't even know about is venous ulceration. So the legs start to swell at first, and then over time, uh, the high pressure from the inside the body actually causes the skin to erode, and we end up with venous ulcerations. Now, this is a hard problem to treat. In fact, there are patients who come to me that have had venous ulcers for more than 30 years. These venous ulcers often exude fluid because of the high pressure in the veins, and many of these patients have been able to be cured um, with certain techniques that ultimately lower the vein pressure. Many of these patients have the blocked iliac veins, and if that's the case, we can treat that. Or some others just have very large varicose veins that are eroding through the skin, and those can be treated as well. So these are very, very important and very treatable disease processes that we have. Now, I'm not speaking much about lymphatic disease, but in many countries, lymphatic disease is equally important. In many of the equatorial countries around the world, there are roundworms that may get into the lymph system and block it. And these patients may develop what's called elephantiasis, where the lower part of the leg swells tremendously. Um, it's a huge problem. In our country, the biggest cause of lymphatic problems uh, are cancer, cancer that is spread through some of the lymph nodes and, and is obstructing flow. But all three of these are vascular disorders, in a sense. They're all very prevalent. Uh, they're important, and I think it's important that we pay as much attention to peripheral arterial disease as we do uh, to, to peripheral vascular disease as not just peripheral arterial, but venous and lymphatic as well. What a great explanation, especially for our patients who may have these risk factors or symptoms, for them to understand and know when they should see a cardiologist for these things. And over the years I've met many of your patients whom you've improved their quality of life, you've saved their limbs, and truly your passion in treating 
peripheral vascular disease is admirable and known to be very innovative. So what is it that is truly behind your passion in treating this? I was trained predominantly in heart disease, as are most people in fellowship. But it became very obvious to me that I had to understand the vascular system better. And so this has been a lifelong quest for me because simply it was important to get my patients better. And many patients have told me, Doc, I've reported these problems for years and they were simply ignored. And I don't think it was so much that they were ignored is that people did not understand what the problem was. So let, let's just talk about vein disease. Let's go to that, that very common disease. I told you more common than arterial or lymphatic, uh, very, very common, most common cardiovascular disorder. What are the common symptoms of that before the ulcers, before the deep vein clot? Well, itching of your legs, restless leg syndrome at night, uh, cramping of the legs, leg swelling, particularly leg swelling that's worse in the late afternoon and gone in the morning because you're laying flat. You're not fighting gravity, getting mm. the blood back. Those are the most common symptoms of venous disease. If one has that, one should consider this. And the first part of therapy is to simply use compression hose. But there are many other therapies that can alleviate these symptoms. Peripheral arterial disease, the most common symptom is exertional leg discomfort or heaviness or weakness. Now, it's very interesting. Most people don't come in and say, my leg cramps when I walk. In fact, they think they're getting old. They attribute their symptoms to arthritis. They, contribute, they attribute their symptoms to getting old. It's not that. It's not that they're getting old. It's not arthritis. When the muscle hurts, it means it's not getting enough blood and should be evaluated. Certainly, uh, one does not need a bypass surgery for all of those. Certainly, one does not need an intervention in terms of an angioplasty or a stent. But all of those patients need some form of intervention. Their cholesterol must be brought to normal. They must quit smoking. They should start an exercise program. If they're not at risk of bleeding, they should consider starting low-dose aspirin. So there are things that should be done, interventions from a medicine perspective, but not necessarily a surgical intervention or other things. The vast majority do not need those. Let's talk about what some of these disease states look like as far as venous disease and maybe those ulcerations. Sure. So venous disease, um, as I've mentioned, is very common. And it's very important to understand and to classify these. So historically, a classification was created, which is called CEAP. And there are six stages of CEAP classification. It's well described in the literature, veins down to where they don't cause problems. Wow, this is why it's so very important to catch the disease in an earlier stage, correct? Is that better yes. to prevent? Yes, and I've had many patients say, well, you're talking about scoring a vein down, don't we need those veins? The answer is, uh, it's better if we have all the veins God's, God gives us, for sure. <laughs> I, I would never argue that. However, those veins, once they become varicose veins, are not working for you. They're working against you. What do I mean by that? Well, we have more veins than our body needs. We have deep veins, which are the primary and the more important veins. They run down near our bones. And then we have veins that run just slightly under the skin. Those that run near the bones, we call deep veins. Those that run under the skin, we call superficial veins. Now, when I say under the skin, I don't mean like a vein here in my hand. These veins are maybe this far, a little further under the skin, but they're not down near the bones. The vast majority of flow is in the deep veins, but the superficial veins play a role. Now, the longest superficial vein in the body is called the greater saphenous. It starts here at the ankle, and it comes in and it dumps in up here in the upper portion of the leg. But with vein insufficiency, what's happening is blood that is coming back as it should in the deep vein, when it gets here, a lot of it runs right back to your leg, and it defeats the purpose of the vein, which is to return blood to the heart to be recirculated. And in that case, it actually causes a bigger problem. 
And so we want all the blood in that case to stay in that deep vein to make that deep vein work better. I know, Dr. Walker, that patients come here from all across the world, across the U.S., down here to us, to CIS, for some of these treatments. Can you tell us why that is? Sure. You know, as we became involved in peripheral vascular disorders, one of the things that we did was we started um, a conference called New Cardiovascular Horizons. This conference was devoted to really improving peripheral vascular care. Physicians from around the world came, participated. It was a great chance for us to educate. I also became editor of Vascular Disease Management, one of the leading journals for this. Now with this, uh, patients came from many different sources and these patients, many of whom were told their only option was a major amputation or were told they had to live with these big venous ulcers. I remember one lady telling me, she said, Doc, I heard about this and I had to come. She says, I for 30 years have been getting up three times a night to change the bed sheets because there's so much protein being spilled mm. in the bed sheets at night that it's wet. Those kinds of things travel by word of mouth. In today's world of the internet, patients speak to people all <laughs> over the world and uh, people hear about this and they, they come. I don't know of anyone who wants to voluntarily lose a leg. I don't know of anyone who ha <laughs> wants to have venous ulcers. And we have to create treatment paradigms and availability to patients that allow them to get over these maladies. These are very important issues, very important, because it is not just about our ability to walk, it's our ability to live. And if we ignore these, they're more likely to hurt us and actually increase our rate of cardiovascular death. Certainly your passion for treating PAD is up so admirable and inspirational and we do encourage our listeners if they feel they may have any of these diseases please visit cardio.com learn more about cis and learn more about how they can get help today thank you for joining us dr walker it is a pleasure thank you